Well, ladies and gentlemen uh, and distinguished guests, my name is uh, Dr. Cathy Liddell and I'm the director of the Law Faculty's Centre for Law, Medicine and Life Sciences. On behalf of our centre, the Centre for Family Law and the Science Festival, I'm delighted to welcome you here to the 2018 Baron Delancey Lecture. Knowing uh, some of you, or many of you, as you were coming in through the door, um, it's quite clear to me that we have not only um, a large number of uh, lawyers, but also a considerable number of scientists and philosophers, uh, members of the public and students, and must say that we are absolutely delighted um, to have such a diverse mix, and it is just what we'd hoped. We are very fortunate and grateful uh, that the lecture series is funded by the University's Vahid and Delancey Fund, which exists to support uh, and uh, uh, expand medical law research and teaching. The fund was bestowed by a foundation in Jersey, which was set up in 1970 in memory of Baron Vahid and Delancey. Two trustees from the board of the Jersey Foundation would ordinarily join us from the Netherlands, Dr. Charlotte Ritter and Dr. Bas van Overkak. But the dates of our science festival clashed with the music festival in Europe that they were also keen to attend. We will miss their sparky company tonight at dinner, uh, but it in no way uh, diminishes our greetings nor our thanks. Dr. Ritter is a descendant of the Baron's childhood sweetheart and second wife. And I have had the pleasure of learning more about the Baron through her and her husband, Baz. He was, by any account, a flamboyant and extraordinary uh, Dutch man who was, at various stages of his career, a doctor, a dentist, a high finance lawyer, and an art collector. So he was clearly a curious and intellectually agile person. He became a rich man, and with his wealth, he identified an opportunity to acquire a baronial title. He also became a public benefactor, and long story short, here we are benefiting from his endeavors. As we are a relatively new center, this is the second year that we have had the opportunity to organize the Baron's Lecture. But the series has had a long history of distinguished speakers. I won't give you the full list, but just by way of example, the first Baron Delancey lecture that I attended uh, was given by Dame Elizabeth Butler Sloss, who was then the president of the Family Division of the Court of Appeal. She talked about recent cases on life and death in the courts. In 2011, uh, from the sciences, we had Professor Sir Peter Luckman, who talked about the effect of tort law and regulation on pharmaceutical supply. In particular, the chilling effect he thought that the law had on the supply of new innovative medicines. In 2016, uh, the first year that LML organised the Baron Delancey Lecture, our invitation was accepted by Mr James Badenoch QC, who spoke about the case he litigated before the UK Supreme Court which changed the judicial requirements of informed consent in clinical negligence. Tonight, our subject is the future of reproductive technology. And we are delighted that our friend and distinguished speaker, Professor Glenn Cohen, has agreed to give the lecture. Glenn is a professor of law at the other great Cambridge Faculty of Law, <laughs> namely Harvard Law School. He is also the director of the Petrie Flom Centre for Health Law Policy, Biotechnology and Bioethics. His work covers a vast area, from the failures to protect the health of NFL players, to the ethics of a system for purchasing kidneys, and the legal issues of health tourism, and pretty much everything in between. <laughs> Such breadth is rarely paralleled. But what I always find most remarkable is Glenn's razor-sharp ability to re reorganise each and every field of thinking he tackles. And no doubt that is what we will also witness tonight. Glenn, thank you and the floor is yours.
Should always ask ahead of time how I advance the slides. Hopefully there's a button. Let's see if it's going to be intuitive. Oh, that's pretty intuitive. I can handle that. Well, thank you very much uh, for having me. I have nothing to disclose. Good news. Um, you know, I give a lot of talks in a year, and I'll tell you the truth, I enjoy every single one of them, but rarely have I felt so honored as I do uh, tonight. A huge thank you to my friends uh, at LML, uh, to the Delancey Foundation for putting this together and sponsoring this. Um, I'm the child of two people who are dropouts from high school. Neither of my parents finished high school. So when I told them today that I was addressing the Faculty of Law at Cambridge University, they were pretty impressed, and I'm pretty impressed to be here too uh, in front of you all. Okay, now down to business, and I'll try to keep it a little fun. Uh, many of you in the audience are undoubtedly parents. Many of you in the, all of you in the audience are certainly children, right? So you've gone through that experience, we have that in common. When a child asks a parent, uh, where do babies come from? At one point in history, the answer was pretty straightforward and easy. You'd say, when a daddy loves a mommy, and then you know, maybe you'd give more or less details depending on how you handle it. Then it got a little bit more complicated. Sometimes it was, a mommy doesn't have a daddy, and she ha okay, so that was a little bit more complicated. But it's never been quite so complicated as it is today, potentially. You might add her sentences like, well, when two daddies love each other very much, and then they found another mommy from a catalog uh, who would donate an egg, and then daddy's first cousin agreed to be the surrogate, right? It's quite complicated, and I'm going to tell you it's about to get more complicated. So I want to start uh, in Act 1 uh, by talking about the progression at a technological level, and we're going to call that the technological imperative. We're then in Act 2 going to talk about legal and political theory and whether it can help us to struggle with these dilemmas. And finally, we're going to talk to, about the state and justification for restricting regulatory, restricting reproductive freedoms. Okay, so let's start with Act 1, the imperative. So once upon a time, coital sex was the main way to produce children. But infertility of the male or female kind has been around just as long as our, for a very long time in our evolutionary history. One of the most uh, poignant depictions is actually in the Old Testament, where Sarah is unable to conceive and first attempts a kind of surrogacy slash adoption slash extramarital approach with Abraham, inseminating her maid Hagar and producing Ishmael. And then she's the first woman to pursue a miracle cure. Many would try to find that miracle cure afterwards. Here with a very good doctor called Hashem, right? God, who cures her infertility and she produces her own son, Isaac. This is uh, Matthias Storm's 1638 depiction of those very events. The classic story really captures quite a lot. The pain and sadness of infertility in a world where genetic reproduction is the norm. The strong social preference for genetic reproduction over adoption. The way in which these technologies will bend the family form, but ultimately society will try to uh, assimilate them into a form of nuclear family. Medical rather than religious attempts to cure infertility begin very early in recorded history, at least as far back as Hippocrates' use of Egyptian-inspired recipes containing red niter, cumin, resin, and honey to try to open up the cervix of infertile women. So I want to start uh, by talking about modern assisted reproductive technologies, but I'm going to call them old school, new school reproduction, because we'll see there's an even newer school reproductive technologies around the corner. Uh, so, you know, this began really with the invention of the microscope in the 1600s, which allowed the visualization of sperm and therefore an understanding of its role in fertilization. This development led to the first artificial insemination of dogs in 1780 in Italy by the priest Lazzaro Spallanzani, and then in humans in 1785 by the Scottish surgeon John Hunter. Artificial insemination using donor sperm first occurred in 1884 by the Dr. William Pancos in Philadelphia. Modern medicine has added a number of methods of treating infertility. For our purposes, though, one of the most important methods is in vitro fertilization, IVF, which was first successfully used here in England in 1978 to produce Louise Brown. IVF proceeds in several stages. First, the woman who will provide eggs is administered ovulation-stimulating hormones, which cause multiple egg-containing follicles to be cured so that she can uh, deliver up to several dozen eggs that can be harvested in a single treatment cycle. 
Then just prior to ovulation, the eggs are removed by a minor surgical procedure. Third, sperm is introduced into the individual culture dishes, each of which contains a culture medium and one egg, and monitored to determine if fertilization occurs. And finally, if it's successful, the early embryo, sometimes called the pre-embryo, is allowed to mature in the medium, where in some or all of them will be transferred into women's uterus to try implantation. Sometimes this is combined with pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, PGD, where we biopsy a cell from the early embryo to assist in determining whether it's the best embryo to implant. IVF is very expensive. Uh, it's a quite painful and quite uh, annoying for women. It also carries some health risks, a low risk, but a risk of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. It may not be the same woman from whose eggs are harvested who will ultimately carry the baby. And in surrogacy, we actually have two individuals involved. In the case of traditional surrogacy, which is hardly practiced these days at all, a man artificially inseminates a woman such that she serves both as the gestational and the genetic mother of the child. In gestational surrogacy, by contrast, gestational surrogacy carrying the child is combined with IVF, such that the egg may come from the woman who intends to rear the child. Either the rearing mother is, or there's another woman who serves as an egg donor, or another man who serves as a sperm donor, or as in a very complicated case uh, from California called Mosqueda, all of the above. There can be a sperm donor, an egg donor, a commissioning and would-be rearing mother, a rearing father, and a gestational surrogate for a grand total of five separate people involved in that reproduction. Imagine answering, where did I come from to that child? <laughs> all of this, while quite amazing, in the longer scope of human history is today old hat to us. We're very familiar with these technologies. But I'm going to take you to the now and near future to talk about what is cutting edge and dilemmas you may not have encountered in a family law class or a medical law class. Okay. First one, uterine transplants. The birth of a child after uterus transplant from a living donor occurred for the first time in Sweden in October 2013 and it spurred reproductive and transplant physicians in Europe and North America to investigate whether uterus transplants, either from living or cadaveric donors, yes, that's right, from a deceased donor to take the uterus and bring life from it, might become a more common occurrence. We've got trials going on in Boston and in the Cleveland Clinic right now. Uh, and the first birth occurred several months ago at Baylor University in Texas in the United States, the first US birth. The main clinical indication is uterine factor infertility, Women who were born without a uterus lost their uterus or their uterus no longer functions. The intended mother's eggs will be removed and fertilized through IVF. Then they'll look for a uterus donor. Most of the protocols in the U.S. are for a cadaveric donor, but it could also be a living donor, and that's what occurred at Baylor. Once a donor is found, the recipient goes on immunosuppressive drugs, and a uterus is transplanted onto her pelvis. After a few months, she'll start having her period, and within 12 months of transplant of the uterus, will hopefully be healed enough that she can take the embryos for implantation. She'll undergo pregnancy with a C-section delivery, and then undergo a hysterectomy after one to two childbirths to remove the donor uterus. Once it's removed, she can go off the immunosuppressive drugs, which is good for her overall health. So in the Baylor case, the donor was a woman named Siler, a registered nurse, mid-30s. She had two boys, age six and four already, and she just read in the newspaper of the hospital about this transplant program. And she says, quote, I have family members who struggle to have babies and it's not fair. I just think that if we can give more people that option, that's an awesome thing, unquote. She went through an extensive screening about her physical and mental health before getting approval for the trial. Required surgery and about 12 weeks of recovery. The surgery is about five hours uh, for the living donor and another equivalent amount of time for the recipient. There's a number of very interesting legal and ethical issues that I want to have you think about and we'll talk more about during the Q&A. Is this really an option we should be supporting? I mean, it's amazing that science can do this, but is this really something we should be pursuing? How important is pregnancy as opposed to genetic motherhood through surrogacy? Should we be willing to allow women to take the risks of transplants that is not, strictly speaking, medically necessary? Should the state pay for it? Would you have the NHS pay for this as it would a kidney transplant? Does it matter whether surrogacy is a legal and available alternative, given this involves more risk to the woman who receives the transplant than surrogacy would? By contrast, if surrogacy is available, or if this is available, 
Would it be unethical to use a surrogate since you are then potentially placing another woman at risk rather than carrying the child to yourself? Should we consider living rather than cadaveric donors? Is it a positive thing if, as in some of the cases in Sweden, mothers donate their uteruses to their daughters with uterine factor infertility? In such a case, a uterus donated by a woman to her daughter to produce a child, do we consider the uterus donor just the grandmother? Is she the grandmother slash uterine mother? Something else? What if any legal status should attach to the grandmother in this case? Should she have the rights of a surrogate, for example, to change her mind, to withdraw the transplant? What happens if there's parenting disputes? Going further into the future, this technology might allow transgender people with male sex assigned at birth or even regular men to bear children. That is, we might be able to graft a uterus on a male pelvis or some other part of the body. I know the men in the, the room are getting a little bit nervous when I'm saying this because they've watched pregnancy on TV at least, right, or in their own lives, right? Would that be a wonderful thing? Think about equality of the sexes if we could do that. Or is that a terrible idea, right? To the state pay for that if as a man you say I've seen this beautiful mystery of pregnancy and birth and I've seen all of this and I want to experience it myself. Is that a rights claim you have against the state? Okay. Second technology, mitochondrial replacement therapy, MRT. Mutant mitochondrial DNA gives rise to a broad range of heritable clinical syndromes. Some dispute in literature about how prevalent it is. The UK's Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority, the HFEA, claims that it's about 1 in 200 children who's born each year. Others think it's more like 1 in 5,000. The diseases of the mitochondria appear to cause the most damage to cells of brain, heart, liver, skeletal muscles, kidney, endocrine, and respiratory systems. Truly terrible for the children who are born with these uh, diseases. There's no cure, uh, but we've recently developed a technology pioneered here in Newcastle in the UK that's raised the prospect of disease-free progeny for women carriers. Mitochondrial replacement therapies constitute a family of technologies that seek to prevent the transmission of the mutant mitochondrial DNA from carrier mother to the child. The embryos so created comprise nuclear DNA from the intended mother and non-pathogenic mtDNA from another woman whom we call the mitochondrial donor. As such, MRTs allow a woman at risk to be the genetic mother of the resulting child, at least in terms of the vast majority of that child's DNA. The two forms, maternal spindle transfer, pronuclear transfer, I'm not going to go into the details here. In the UK, legislating, legislation enabling the performance and clinical application of MRT was 10 years in the making and approved by the House of Commons and the House of Lords in 2015. The HFEA is now empowered to provide clinical licenses to allow the use of these technologies. In the US, where I come from, the story is quite different. We were in the midst of a review by the Institute of Medicine, National Academies of Medicine, requested by our FDA, our drug authority, when Congress acted to preemptively block this technology. And here's where I'll pander a little bit to my crowd here in the UK and say how much I admire the HFEA, Parliament and your public consultation, the Nuffield Council, on these topics. But don't get too comfortable. Towards the end of the talk, I will blast the uh, UK and your approach on child welfare. So it's coming. Don't worry that I'm not, I'm not playing the crowd, warming you up a little bit, only for the axe to fall in the end. So our national academies would have liked to see an approach like the uh, UK's, maybe a little bit more restrictive. They said that they were okay with MRT going forward, subject to several conditions, including establishing initial safety, minimizing risk, establishing efficacy through in vitro, animal, and other testing, limiting clinical investigation to cases where women would transmit serious mitochondrial DNA disease, and interestingly, limiting gestation to male-only embryos. And the reason was to prevent any germline transmission. They also wanted to use non-viable embryos to develop the science when possible and use only the smallest and least developed viable human embryos when it's not, as well as doing long-term follow-up studies on the psychological and physical health of children born through MRT. One of the realities of the U.S. prohibition is that we've now engendered a huge amount of medical travel, medical tourism, a topic I wrote a book about in 2015. Because of the lack of availability in the United States, we've had people, doctors from the U.S., go to Mexico to perform the technology for a Jordanian family, actually. 
And if there's more MRT, and the children in question will in all likelihood end up living in the United States and thereby potentially bringing to pass that which is feared, which again is this transmission of mutant mitochondrial DNA, the, the transmission, I should say, of the corrected DNA. So in terms of the legal and ethical issues, one is just safety. How do you ever know when a technology like this is ready for prime time? And if you go back to 1978 to IVF, how did we really know that IVF was ready to produce children? There's always going to be this moment of a leap to first in humans. There's this question about crossing the germline red line, the idea that germline modification of the human genome is something we must never do. And among the most vocal opponents on this score was Marcy Darnofsky, who in Nature wrote that she was putting, we were, quote, putting a high-tech eugenic social dynamic into play, unquote. Lots of thoughts on this. We can talk a little bit about, about it a little later today. Uh, but my own sense is that I'm not terribly upset by the idea if this is eugenics, quite I'm query what that means. I'm not particularly bothered by this form of eugenics if what it means is that children are born healthy rather than with mitochondrial disorders. There's a question about anonymity and parentage. So in the US, we don't have a requirement as we do in this country that sperm donors and egg donors put their names in a registry available to children at age 18. In this country, you do. But interestingly, Parliament exempted the mitochondrial donor from this requirement. So you, as a donor-conceived child, cannot go ahead and find out who your mitochondrial donor was. Even though, technically speaking, we call this three-parent IVF, and the mitochondrial donor is giving a very small percentage of the DNA to the child. Nonetheless, you might say, without that donor, I would not come into existence. If I want to know the story of where I came from. This person is an essential part of that drama. And to push your buttons a little bit, if this country believes so much in the right to know your genetic heritage, the right to know your genetic parents, why don't we allow them to know the identity of the mitochondrial donor? Maybe it should be a percentage. Maybe you could get like a percentage of the mitochondrial DNA, the same percentage of information about that person, right? I imagine like from Salman Rushdie's at Midnight's Children, you know, moving the veil and seeing just a tiny little bit of the person each time you diagnose them. So maybe just the eye colors or maybe just this much, right? In any event, we haven't gone there in this country. I think most interesting is the question of mandatory sex selection. Essentially, the FDA recommended, or the IOM, I should say, recommended, that we have mandatory sex selection. Only male embryos, because the male embryos will not carry forward the alteration done to the mitochondria uh, in order to make, avoid the disease. So that's a very interesting question. Could or should the state be allowed to mandate sex selection in a particular case? We have other instances, mostly with sex-linked disorders, where they do recommend and do permit sex selection, but that's to protect the child themselves, right? So the child does not uh, develop a syndrome or a disorder. Here, you're not doing it for the sake of the child, but some high abstract concept of the gene pool and concern about the propagation of a particular genetic change. Should we find that abhorrent to mandate sex selection, would it be against the law? Okay, one more technology. And that is in vitro gametogenesis. It's the generation of eggs and sperm from pluripotent stem cells in a culture dish. And I'm particularly worried about talking about this one because we have one of the Nobel Prize winners whose work is essential for this later technology in the room with us today. So I'm going to tread lightly and not talk too much about the science here. But I'm showing you Hikabe's Nature's Paper in Mice uh, and the potential future successes in human beings as a possibility. So to simplify the science a lot, a lot, a lot, you can take adult cells, like human skin cells, you can induce them towards pluripotency, and from that you can create sperm or egg for reproduction. Translate to the non-scientists, I could take the water that I leave on this cup after drinking this water, which I will between now and the next slide. I could take the saliva or part of my body or skin cell I leave on this cup. See how I work that in. And then I, I needed a little bit of water, but it was a good time. And then what I can do is I can take that cell and I can induce it to become sperm or egg, and then you can produce a baby from this. And if I just happen to leave this here, it's possible you could produce my genetic child from this. Kind of blows your mind a little bit, doesn't it? So IBG may enable prevention of mitochondrial diseases. Indeed, patient-specific iPSC-derived oocytes selected for their low burden of mutant mtDNA could yield disease-free progeny. 
The availability of fully functional gametes of iPSC origin may transform the current IVF paradigm by eliminating the need for stimulating the ovaries and retrieving eggs. In so doing, IVJ may also phase out the occasional morbidity and mortality women suffer from ovarian hyperstimulation. Similarly, we may not need donor eggs anymore. Wouldn't that be wonderful? No need for egg donors. Much would depend on whether IVG could ever become affordable enough to be used as a current technology and thus enhanced access to advanced infertility therapy. Given the high price of IVF, that may be unlikely. Some in the bioethics, legal, and public press have speculated further. The scientists tend not to like the speculation, but I'll share it, that IVG may one day permit same-sex partners who seek to have a child who shares both parents' genetic heritage, with one producing the sperm and one producing the egg, even though they are of the same sex, or possibly enable single women to conceive offspring of a single parentage based on their own. Lots of legal and ethical issues. This is my friend Hank Greeley's excellent book, the end of sex on uh, a version of this topic. Uh, any clinical use of IVG raises several regulatory and ethical questions. First, refining the science to a point where it's usable will mean the generation and likely destruction of huge numbers of embryos from stem cell derived gametes. IVG might also increase our chances of commodification of the human body, giving the possibility of creating mass numbers of embryos, biopsying all of them, a thousand, and choosing the best one. Imagine if you had an unlimited ability to produce eggs and sperm for a child. Would you not be tempted to use that towards enhancement? Especially if that production is combined with gene editing, CRISPR-Cas9. Right? We really can potentially in the future, and I think it's far in the future, but potentially in the future, move to a situation where enhancement becomes uh, rapid. Fourth, IVG increases the risk of unauthorized use of biometrics, absent explicit consent. In the most extreme case, imagine an individual using someone else's sloth skin cells to derive gametes for reproductive purposes. Should the law criminalize that action? If it takes place, should the law consider the source of the skin cells, me on this cup, the father, a legal parent who has child support obligations or has a right to make family decisions? So far, courts have had very little experience with non-consensual parenthood, but the cases they have had uh, involving intoxication where consent was inappropriate, involving statutory rape of young boys, actually. There are cases like this that produce child. In all of those cases, they essentially hold, at least in the states, that the boy is the father of the child and has legal obligations. Should we follow that pattern in thinking about this truly non-consensual form of parenthood? Finally, IVG's most disruptive impact may be on our very conception of parentage. Artificial insemination, IVF, surrogacy, they've all allowed us to unbundle genetic, gestational, and legal parenthood to some extent. But here we're talking about a much more radical unbundling, right? Again, the scientific literature has not yet proven feasibility, but there's this possibility that's so-called multiplex parenting, where one gamete is derived from two individuals or three individuals or five individuals, right? So imagine five genetic parents, apart from rearing parents, apart from surrogates, and the like. Would we view each of those as an equal parent, or would we want to uh, apportion parentage rights, maybe days of custody, based on the percentage of genetic material they contribute? What happens when you're trying to decide what university to send the child to? Do you have them all in the room, and is there like a consensus rule, or is it just you know, the loudest shout or the person who's going to pay for it? Is that how you decide? Should what extent should the law respect a contractual agreement between these people to allocate parental rights and parental responsibilities? The situation becomes still more complex if we mix together this technology with surrogacy or with adoption and the like. So thus ends Act 1. Some combination of wonder, disgust, and confusion. Or that's at least what I'm going for. Now we're ready for Act 2. Can political theory or legal theory help us? Some framing attempts. Okay. In terms of disruption, we broadly think of the preceding cases as presenting two kinds of disruption. One is actually disruption of the outcome in terms of family form. The other is the disruption of method in terms of the way in which it comes about. One focuses us on the family that results, and that family could have resulted through non-reproductive technologies, single parenthood, same-sex parenthood, right? That can happen without reproductive technologies, through divorce and remarriage, uh, single parenthood. 
The other focuses more on the ills of the technology themselves, right? And the question about whether it promotes something like an incorrect attitude towards parenthood, uh, whether it is uh, promoting embryo destruction, et cetera, et cetera. So here's a set of distinctions that I think might be particularly helpful when thinking about selective funding and more positive rights to health care in this space, the question of what should the state fund. And that is the distinction on the one hand between mimics and extenders, and on the other hand between the infertile and the disfertile. So let me say a little bit more about those distinctions. Mimics seek to use reproductive technology to achieve uh, that which others are able to achieve through coital forms of reproduction. When infertile women use IVF and infertile men use AID to achieve what their fertile brothers and sisters can achieve coitally. By contrast, extenders use reproductive technologies to achieve that which is not obtainable by anyone without the use of these technologies. Gene editing to have children with longer lives. IVG to have children with five or six parents. Uh, this is a, that's what I mean when I think about extension. And this is kind of a... Um, cousin, if you will, to the treatment enhancement distinction. Mimics seek treatment, extenders seek enhancement. Now, none of these distinctions are perfect uh, sorters. So take MRT, for example. Is that a case of mimicry, a woman who wants to have a genetically related child just like other women? Or is it a case of extension involving a third party, a third genetic parent in reproduction? Which line matters, what you're intending to do or the consequence or the genetic line, the biological line, or what the family formation looks like? But while not perfect, these distinctions can nonetheless be helpful in thinking about the state's positive obligation to provide assistance. And uh, let me talk about the second distinction, which is infertile versus disfertile. Infertility is a medical condition, right? It is a medical diagnosis which prevents you from being able to reproduce. Disfertile individuals suffer from a form of social infertility. Their biology works fine, but they suffer from no disease, but their biology is such that their current social arrangement does not permit reproduction. They are a single individual. They are a same-sex couple, for example. So one way of putting this question is, in which of these boxes, if this is a two-by-two, two, which of these boxes are the ones the state ought to pay for? So it depends a lot on your theory of health what the right to health extends to. So on a purely consequentialist theory, health is an important, indeed one of the most important things that promote our welfare, but there's nothing in particular special. There's no special importance to health as a moral matter. It's just merely one contributor to welfare. And for that, these distinctions don't seem to matter too much. What really matters is how much welfare would we get for how much cost. So the economist, for example, might do a quality-adjusted life here per dollar analysis and support the technologies that have the highest value, avoid the ones that have the lowest. Other theories, though, attach a special importance to health. They then have to wrestle whether the question of what kinds of reproductive assistance are health assistance as opposed to other kinds of benefits. So Martha Nussbaum, writing from an Aristotelian perspective, talks about the idea that we have capabilities, right? The state has an obligation to further our capabilities and enable human flourishing. She describes one of these capabilities, bodily health, as being able to achieve a good health, including reproductive health, to be adequately nourished, to have adequate shelter, and another bodily integrity as having choice in matters of reproduction. Norman Daniels, my now retired colleague, has a much more Rawlsian view uh, of the matter. That's a liberal tradition focused on promoting liberty and distributive justice through priority to the worst off. He would say the state's role, the state's obligation, uh, is to give you access to the, quote, normal opportunity range, unquote. That is, to enable you to pursue an array of life plans reasonable persons are likely to develop for themselves. And from this, he says, reasonable people, a normal life plan includes reproduction, Therefore, the state has an obligation to pay for infertility, just as it would for a kidney disease, uh, Ebola, or what have you. Both these views, but in particular the Daniels view, have something useful to say about these categories. The concept of a normal opportunity range, by definition, seems to count in support for mimics, but not extenders. Extenders want something more than that which is part of the normal opportunity range, the species-typical function, right? They want to be atypical of the species. They want more than what the species can do. Perhaps more controversially, I think suggesting drawing a line between the infertile and the disfertile on this view. 
Only the infertile are making claims for the state to restore them to species-typical normal functioning. The disfertile are already usually there, though query how to treat the claim of a lesbian who also happens to suffer from female factor infertility. Would we say she is infertile, disfertile, or both? Now this result is not inevitable. We could reinterpret the normal opportunity range, which is meant to enable us to pursue life plans reasonable persons are likely to develop in a non-biological sense. In that way, we would say what is sought is parenthood, not biological functioning. But doing so raises another interesting tension. Is the goal of the state and the goal of the healthcare system parenthood, simpliciter, or genetic parenthood? That is, suppose the state were to say, I've satisfied my obligation to you by giving you a wide range of support and availability of adoption options. Would we say that that is a health care obligation being satisfied, or must the state go further? And to take it a little bit further, think about my uterine transplant case. Imagine a woman has another woman willing to serve as the surrogate. We can pay for her IVF, and we do. So she will be the genetic mother of the child. She will be the legal mother of the child. But she says, I want to experience pregnancy. I want to experience gestational motherhood, right? Do we think her right to health extends to that case, to the experience of pregnancy? Is that the kind of thing she ought to be able to make a claim on the NHS for? And of course, taking it to the reductio, the last step in this, would be to say, imagine there's a woman who just wants to experience the pregnancy. She has no interest in rearing the child. She has no interest in genetic parenthood but she is the sister of someone who has uterine infertility and says, oh, I have uterine infertility too, but you know what, I'll carry that child for me. NHS, you give me that uterus transplant, not so I can have my own child, that is one that I will rear, but to be a surrogate for someone else. That is the reproductive desire I have. Is that the kind of thing that a right to health care extends? Is that species typical functioning? Most people don't want to experience pregnancy. I mean, I don't say most people, but parts of pregnancy, having spent a number of months with pregnant women, I can tell you, there are elements, haven't experienced it myself yet, waiting for that pelvic transplant, but I can tell you, having experienced and spent a lot of time with pregnant women, there are many things that are beautiful and wonderful about pregnancy. Lots of days that just suck, though, by the way, right? But imagine someone says, I would really like to experience this, right? Is that a reproductive aim or reproductive goal that they ought to be able to satisfy? Thinking a little bit more now about the negative side here, negative liberty side, that is your right against state inferior interference, here's a set of distinctions I found useful in earlier work I've done about a decade ago now. And that is to say, natural reproduction bundles gestational, genetic, and legal parentage. But it need not be so. We could, in fact, unbundle it, and reproductive technologies let us see that, in fact, there are actually six rights involved in most decisions about, say, an abortion. That is a right to be a gestational parent, to be a genetic parent, to be a legal parent. That is a right to continue a pregnancy. On the other hand, a right not to be a gestational parent, a genetic parent, and a legal parent. That is a right by somebody who seeks to have an abortion. Now, what's interesting about reproductive technologies is that while these are all together, right, we parcel them together in the case of natural reproduction, they can actually be assigned to different people in the case of reproductive technologies, such that we can have conflicts between them. So imagine that a husband and wife undergo in vitro fertilization. They cryopreserve pre-embryos. Imagine that they have an agreement saying that in the event of divorce, the wife would be able to implant the pre-embryos. The couple divorces and the wife wants to use the pre-embryos, but the husband opposes that. Imagine further, for the purpose of this hypothetical, that under these circumstances, the jurisdiction says if the wife implants the pre-embryos, the husband will not be made the legal parent of the child unless he consents. And in case you think this is far-fetched, this is the exact law and legal question before the Colorado Supreme Court uh, right now, as argued about a month ago or two months ago. The husband in such a case is saying, I have a right not to be a genetic parent. I'm not going to be a gestational parent. He doesn't have to carry the child. I'm also, by dint of the law, not going to be made a legal parent. All I'm going to be is a, a genetic parent, but I have a right not to be that genetic parent. On the flip side, the woman would like to assert her right to be a gestational parent, a genetic parent, and a legal parent by using the embryos. Right? This unbundling of the rights helps us see what's at stake. Many other examples I could give you where this is useful. What I want to suggest to you is it suggests that the task of the state and the task of the political theorist, the legal theorist, is to answer two questions. First, or at least two. 
which of these rights actually exist as a doctrinal matter, as a normative matter in terms of what ought to exist? And second, if more than one of these rights exist, what is the system of lexical priority that I will apply in determining when they come into conflict? Or is it at the level of principle lexical priority of rights, or is it much more particularized? Do I think, for example, as in the Evans case, that a case where a woman has no further options reproductively because of ovarian uh, cancer, for example, is that different from a case where a woman could use her own eggs to reproduce uh, in another occasion? Uh, so I think this is a helpful recipe in thinking about the negative liberty, just as I think uh, the prior slide is a helpful recipe in thinking about the positive liberty. So in this act, uh, we see that while these cases are challenging that I presented to you, legal and political theory can at least help us somewhat to frame and narrow the disputes. Okay, now we're ready for the last act, justification in the state. So in the ordinary course of things, the technological imperative results in an ex existence of a market in reproductive technologies. Reproductive techno desires meet technological progress and entrepreneurial opportunity to always push the boundaries. But of course, the state has a role in setting limits. How and when should state should do so is the question for this act. And I don't mean to prejudge the idea that the state is sinister by showing this gentleman over here watching all of us, just saying, you know, uh, if there happens to be some subliminal prime, well, I don't know, it's okay that that happened. So let's talk about the role of the state here. Okay. So first, it's important to understand the state has several means to influence our reproductive activities. And here I've listed them from the most intrusive to the least intrusive. Physical alteration, according to theory, requires sterilization, as we do by order for some parts of the population. Criminal prohibition, we prohibit brother-sister incest in many countries as punishable by law. We uh, prohibit gamete sale in some places. We also prohibit sperm donor anonymity. Immutable or default status determination. So rules, for example, about when a known sperm donor will not be held to be a father. The unenforceability of contracts. We can make a contract for a particular reproductive arrangement like surrogacy enforceable or not. Selective funding. We can choose to fund IVF only for married people but not single people, only for heterosexuals but not gay people. And finally, information provision. We can just try to, the gentlest nudge, try to convince people to do things different. And my favorite example here is actually abstinence education, very popular in some parts of the United States, right? We try to control when people reproduce by having curricula that tell them they should wait till marriage, you know? Okay. There's a series of justifications one could marshal for each of these. And as the intrusiveness of the intervention by the state goes up, so the demandingness of the reason we might need to justify it will go up as well. So here are some basic categories in law and in philosophy. The first is the harm principle. The act of reproduction is to be regulated for harm it will do to third parties. Either harm to the child, what I'll call best interests of the resulting child, BIRC, or harm to other third parties, what I'll call reproductive externalities. Those are a family of arguments you could offer. Paternalism. The act of reproduction is to be regulated because it goes against the true deep interests of the reproducers or participants. So, for example, the surrogate or the egg donor, we want to protect them. Legal moralism or virtue ethics. Two separate but related ideas. The first is what Joel Feinberg called legal moralism in the narrow sense. The use of criminal law to deter acts which neither harm nor offend but undermine public morality, right? We have a conception, a traditionalist conception of what the family should look like. This undermines it. Therefore, that's a reason to prohibit it. Relatedly, virtue ethics conceptions, which, which considers what will happen to the character of the moral agent. So Michael Sandel, my colleague at Harvard, for example, is opposed to enhancement because he thinks it encourages an attitude towards our children that is bad, treats them as manufacture, and also evinces an attitude of uh, lack of openness to the unbidden, which he thinks is unvirtuous for a flourishing person. And finally, wronging while overall benefiting. An act could be wrong and should be regulated because it wrongs a child, even though it does not harm them, or if you prefer, an act... Uh, wrong someone even though overall it benefits them. That's Shauna Schifrin's uh, formulation. While not completely exhaustive, this covers most of the waterfront. 
However, the big red arrow over there is to show you that almost all discourse about regulating reproduction happens along this discourse. And just to show you that I'm not making this up, here's you. Here's the UK, right? So this is from the HFEA Act of 1990, right? A woman shall not be provided with treatment services unless account has been taken of the welfare of the child who may be born as a result of the treatment, including the need of that child for a father. The 2008 version of the act, much more PC, got rid of this father stuff, but kept out, you know, that's kind of, you know, I don't know. I'll, I'll, say, I'll, leave, I'll leave you to your own devices what you think about that, but kept this idea of child welfare at the center. And of course, it's so intuitive. How lovely. You love children. You care about children and their welfare. It seems so intuitive. But the problem is, this form of justification is a lie. It is a hollow, empty lie. I told you that there would be a part where I would bite the hand that feeds me, right? <laughs> Hopefully, they won't cancel the dinner after this. It's a hollow, empty lie, right? That, in fact, can't bear the weight you're putting on it. BIRC reasoning, best interest of the resulting child reasoning, is a non-starter for any attempt by the state to influence when, whether, or with whom we reproduce. And its, its error is to transpose an idea that makes perfectly sense with existing children, their best interest, the best interest of existing children, and transpose that very sensible idea, the idea of children who have not yet come into existence. Why is that a problem? The problem is easiest to see in a case involving restrictions on whether individuals reproduce. So say there's a 60-year-old woman who wants to use reproductive technologies. The state says we're not going to allow that to occur because we're concerned about the child that will result. Many European states have exactly this law. Can we say that this noble statute protects that child, serves that child's interest? No. It protects that child out of existence. So long as that child would have a life worth living, it can't be said that if the act of reproduction had gone forward, the child had been harmed. And just to illustrate this, these are two possible worlds. In this world, 60 plus is permitted. We have this child over here. In this one, it's restricted. No child comes into existence. So the claim people are making when they employ child welfare is to say, this child is so much better off that nobody came into existence, right? That seems like a logical problem. And indeed, it is. But the logic extends further to more cases. Uh, and here, this is from the late, great British philosopher uh, Derek Parfit, who developed this idea of the non-identity problem in 1984. He offered the following hypothetical. Take a 14-year-old girl who we're trying to convince to wait to get pregnant, both for her sake, that's paternalism, but also for the sake of the child, that's BIRC. As he writes, as long as her child does not have a life not worth living, we can't claim that the girl's decision was worse for her child. Why? Because had she listened to us and waited, a different child would have come into existence, not this child. It cannot be worse for this child to come into existence, even with a bad start in life, if the only alternative was not existing at all and instead being replaced by another point, another child. This point generalizes to at least any case where the policy enacted by the state has at its anticipated effect altering the sperm and egg combination. That is, any state attempt to alter when, whether, or with whom individuals reproduce cannot be justified on the basis of child welfare reasoning. Here I illustrate with a different UK policy, and that's the prohibition of an open market in sperm or eggs. So there may be many good reasons to prohibit the market of sperm and eggs, but child welfare isn't one of them. Because when gamete, oh, it should be sale sake. Apparently, I'm thinking ahead to the wine at dinner. This should be gamete sale permitted. If gamete sale is permitted, this child, if helpfully for illustrative purposes, made it a girl, gets born. If it's prohibited, well, maybe you have to wait longer for a gamete, if not indefinitely. Even if a child comes into existence, it's a different sperm donor who will provide the sperm at a different time. Therefore, a different child will come into existence. And if you wanted to know, did the prohibition on gamete sale help this child? It's nonsensical to say how we determine that is to look to see whether this child is better off. You're replacing people. It's not the same person in both counterfactuals. That is a problem for any child welfare analysis. Okay. So if I'm right, that means the major way in which most states, including this country, justify the regulation of reproduction is nonsensical, is uh, logically fallacious, not just even like you disagree, it just doesn't make sense. Does that mean you can't regulate reproduction? 
No, but it means things are much more complicated and the easy, sunny, nice, we love children bumper sticker won't work. Instead, you have to go deeper down into political theoretical disagreements and try to resolve them. I've told you about some of these possibilities, paternalism, legal moralism, wronging while overall benefiting. I'm now just gonna spend a moment and I'm gonna wrap up on these other ones that I've added now to the picture. So the non-identity problem is only a problem for cases involving lives that are worth living. If you're going to produce a child that has a life not worth living, you can say that child is worse off coming into existence than otherwise. By the way, this very logic that I'm talking about with the non-identity problem, fascinatingly, the courts have understood this. The rejection of wrongful life liability, including in this country since 1982, understands this idea, and yet the regulatory system does not, which is kind of interesting. But if you have a life that's not worth living, that's okay. You can prevent that life and you're doing good. But the category of lives not worth living, I want to suggest to you is going to be very, very small. How small will depend a little bit on how you think bad a particular life or a particular disability might be. But it's certainly not going to encompass cases of older mothers, of uh, people who are the product of a commodified market, of many of the things in which the regulators want to reach. A different view is called non-person affecting principle approach. It's a mouthful. Essentially, our con typical conception of harm and benefit, those are person affecting. The same person is made better or worse. You are harmed or you are benefited by a regulation. In non-person affecting approaches, we say, the world is not better because any person is made better. Rather, the world is better or worse in an impersonal sense. That is, although the person born with the condition in question would not have been harmed by birth, the world is better off if that person without that harm has been substituted in the place. So this is the claim that we're not making you better or worse by regulating. We're instead doing good by replacing you with somebody better. That is essentially what this claim is. It sounds nasty when you put it that way, but that's essentially what the idea is. In other work, I suggest there's a lot of reasons why this may not be the most attractive approach to regulating reproduction. It carries with it some eugenic overtones. It might suggest the state could equally well be justified in mandating human enhancement because that also replaces us with better people. It's under-inclusive. There are many acts of sexual coital reproduction that end up bringing into existence people who are less good than the people we could have brought into existence. But we would never dream of starting to regulate those, yet we feel like it's okay to pick on uh, reproductive technology access. And there's many other problems with it. Probably the most prominent one is a problem of population ethics, that this whole theory is only gonna be good in cases where the same number of people come into existence either way, where it's one-to-one -one swaps because otherwise we will end up in a series of population ethics paradoxes that Parfit calls the repugnant conclusion and the mere addition paradox that we can talk about during Q&A if people are interested. Well, what does that leave us? We could think about reproductive externalities. It's a little strange. When you decide how loud you can play your stereo, when you decide whether you can have a wild animal that runs across your neighbor's lawn, when you blow black smoke from one property to the other, we often, especially in law and economics, think about these as externalities, a behavior of yours that causes costs for others. It's a little strange that we never talk about reproduction in terms of externalities, but you could think the right way to think about this is what's wrong about an act of reproduction is the costs it imposes on other people in a community. And the more socialized your community is in terms of healthcare and the like, the more justified that would be. So that is a possible way of talking and thinking about these disputes. But again, it's one that very quickly takes us into very disturbing territory, many of which parallels the problems with the non-person affecting principal approach. So I, you know, I've often said that when I die on my tombstone, it will say, uh, never did he find a hard problem he could not make harder. But that is my <laughs> goal for tonight, is to show you that the easy answer given by the UK and many industrialized countries, you're in good company, uh, to how we think about regulating reproduction and when the state can act is bogus. So just to sum up, what have I tried to show you tonight? One, we have not reached firm agreement on the old school new reproductive technologies, and now we have coming down the pipeline even more head-scratching and amazing ones. These are great news for people who suffer from infertility, and in fact for the progress of science, and good news for law professors and ethicists like me, because it keeps us in business, but maybe bad news for those of you who thought when you left Cambridge you would understand what the right answer would be because new technologies keep coming. 
Second, though, we've equipped you through legal and political theory to actually think about this. On the positive liberty side, theory about the right to health might matter. On the negative liberty side, some conception of unbundling might help. Third, though, don't pat yourself on the back too much, because probably the way most people have reasoned about these cases, and most governments have reasoned about these cases, the idea of best interest of the resulting child uh, is a non-starter. And when we attempt to go deeper and find ideas that actually work, you'll see that both the philosophy and then the political level of agreement over them dwindles. So there's a lot of hard work ahead of us. Thank you very much, uh, and uh, I look forward to your questions. Hi, I'm Jeff Skopek. I'm Deputy Director of the Center. And as Deputy Director, I have the pleasure of giving the vote of thanks tonight. I've been told that in some European countries, uh, giving a vote of thanks requires giving a summary of the entire talk just to prove that one was paying attention. Uh, thankfully for me, giving the vast breadth of Glenn's talk, and thankfully, uh, or luckily for you, I should say, uh, given that I'm sure you have questions you want to ask, I will not attempt to summarize all that has been said. Um, rather, I will uh, limit myself to just thanking Glenn deeply for coming here to Cambridge tonight to speak with us. Um, he comes to us uh, from Mexico City via Copenhagen, uh, after which he goes to Miami before returning to the other Cambridge. So he's uh, clearly very busy, and I am uh, consider myself lucky that he accepted our invitation to come speak with us tonight. Uh, so without uh, further ado, I do want to turn it over to Q&A. Um, so that uh, we have a bit of time before the reception will start. Um, so I'll just ask you to uh, thank me once again for... Sorry, thank me, no. You should thank me, actually. Thank you, yes. Well done. You can thank me for uh, bringing such a good speaker, but join me in thanking Glenn for a truly fascinating talk that took us from Abraham... Um, through uterine transplant, mitochondrial replacement theory, and IVF, uh, to political theory, uh, theory about the role of the state. So I think a truly fascinating talk, and I will now turn it over to Q&A, but yeah, please join me in thanking. Glenn.